Homeland. You know, I meant to rewatch season two before we got to this point, but I didn't get to it. <laughs> and I'll be honest, that left me a bit lost as to where everyone was on the chessboard before we jumped back in. But uh, pieced together a few things. You know, Saul's now leading the CIA after that big bombing last season. I root for mm-hmm. Saul, so I think I'm happy about that. But then we learn he doesn't really enjoy it much, so maybe I don't feel good about him being CIA director. No, but that's the thing, is that that makes it even better. Like, he's the underdog hero who doesn't want to be a hero, who's just sort of inherited something, and, and he's, like, acting director, and nobody else can do it as, as good as him uh, is the way the show sort of portrays it. But I see. I see what you're saying. So you want someone who doesn't want the job to be CIA director. Yeah, yeah. Like, it's working for me. Well, Saul's always been one of the better characters to always love. Like, he's nuanced, and he's he's had some flaws and made some mistakes I guess but by comparison to everything else um, he, he's the guy that he's like the rock in the show so to and speak that, and that beard I feel like the beard should get its own credit in the opening credits <laughs> it's true it's an awesome beard uh, so Saul's first big decision is whether to hit six terrorism targets at the same time and after some soul searching he decides to go with it and in my opinion he's thoughtful and decisive in just the right way as they run into an obstacle and Quinn hesitates on his target because the kid's there. So, But they go for it anyway, and the kid still ends up dying. I wonder if that's some sort of metaphor for something. But uh, anyway, it's an operational success, even though the investigative congressional committee later thinks it's a calculated distraction. Yeah, and even before that, if you, if you noticed, Saul said it was executed flawlessly. So I couldn't tell if they were trying to make a point that he was brushing aside a flaw or if he just didn't know about the flaw. Um, you mean killing the kid? Yeah, killing the kid. Uh, Saul may not even know about the flaw, though, right? Right, that's what I'm thinking. Uh, I just found it interesting that his his use of the word flawlessly, you know, executed. Uh, like, oh, well, not really, but okay. It didn't seem flawless to us, yeah. Yeah, and I, I don't know. I feel like um, I got to I gotta get up on my soapbox just for like 10 seconds to just the alarm bells are ringing a little bit here with the whole premise of the CIA being an agency that, and even it self-references itself in the show a little bit, uh, taking out six terrorists on three continents at the same time two months after a 9-11 like attack. They've put all the the pieces together, this single agency which has been crippled after being bombed and they're the heroes now and then they don't get credit for it because it's a sideshow just to make them look good is what the committee thinks and I just felt like this is a lot of ham-fisted stuff going on here from a writing perspective. Eh." But Whatever. Yeah, well, I, I couldn't... Yeah, I don't I don't know what we're supposed to take from it. I mean, one of the things that occurred to me is that maybe Saul might be good at the at the CIA part of it, but of the politics, he might um, he might need to start learning how how things come across. Or, I don't know. Uh, you're right, I noticed that too, and I, I don't know what to, to make of it. Well, and are you willing to suspend disbelief on the, like, you know, CIA being back together and being able to carry this out, even independent of Saul's way of uh, uh, presenting it, I just felt like, wow, this is, that's impressive for them to start in episode one, a six, you know, six terrorists on three continents, and it's a successful mission, when, like, we had previous seasons of this show where the whole thing was about one dude that they couldn't catch. But, whatever. <laughs> um... Yeah, I guess I am. I, I'm, not like, willing, sure. I'm not willing to defend it, <laughs> but I, I guess I'm willing to buy it. Okay, okay, I'm stepping down now. We can go back to, like, more uh, things. Okay, Carrie is, you know, for her part, she's back off active duty, and she's also off her meds. Mm. Um, so she's testifying before the committee, too, and they're constantly blindsiding her and making her look really bad in the Abu Nazir and Brody investigation. Someone is leaking documents to the committee and also to the press, and uh, Carrie crashes Saul's lunch to yell at him, and right then, it was right then when I remembered what the best part of the show is, the relationship between Saul and Carrie. You know, Carrie's raging, understandably, and Saul stays calm and tells her she's wrong, and then after Carrie's gone, Saul's turn to F. Murray Abraham, I should learn his character's name for next week, <laughs> right. uh, but Saul basically says he believes Carrie, that it, it looks like what F. Murray would do. I just I love the layers there of that relationship. Yeah, I, I do too. Now, the, the one thing that was a little bit of a snag for me is uh, F. Murray Abraham's character was was pretty complicated in the previous season because he was sort of secretly doing things and then he sort of became less secret and I guess he was a good guy on the right side eventually. And now he's like second in command. He's like Commander Riker. And I'm like, oh, 
uh, I feel like his his uh, backstory was more complicated than what where he stands now. But that's just me, maybe. Yeah, I mean, I guess if you blow up half the CIA, you can sort of pick anyone you want to be <laughs> in the command structure, huh? Right. Um, yeah, and to add to the layers there, when Saul is before the committee at the end, uh, the chairman asks about the article in the paper that got Kerry so upset, and Saul basically throws Kerry under the bus, saying she's bipolar and she hid a ton of stuff from him, which is true, but he's always protected her before. I, I was not expecting that. I wasn't sure what to make of that either. I, I feel like there's some strategic chess move that's four moves ahead that made it so he had to present it that way because, of course, this is all speculative in terms of, you know, there are no names associated with this mysterious person, even though we all know it's Carrie because we're watching the show. Right. And maybe he's got something up his sleeve where by presenting it this way, he's actually going to protect and and save Carrie in another way. But I'm really stretching. It, it, for me right now, I'm in the dark as to how that was supposed to be good. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to think... So um, Dana is in treatment, rehab, I'm thinking, what for exactly? But, oh, yeah, she's on suicide watch. Um, they recommend family counseling, but Brody's gone, so they have no money. Uh, but Dana did make a boyfriend inside, and they're texting naked pics to each other. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sounds great, Dana. I don't know. Like, she's always been that character that I kind of want him to develop the son a little bit and, like, split the time between the two kids, but I guess we're all we're, we're full on here with Dana and the Suicide Watch theme, which is kind of like... Yeah, last season when they hit that person, she and her boyfriend at the time, that season, I just, ah, I was not into that. Right. It felt like we already had enough going on, but whatever. <laughs> uh, there's no Brody in this episode, by the way. Did you miss him? Yeah. Um, I thought I, I, I missed him, but at the same time, I thought it was well played to, to, to do a season opener without him. I think it's going to prove to be a stronger uh, execution. That's speculative, but I, I thought the episode held its own, and uh, it'll just get stronger for introducing him a little bit later. So that's, I don't know. I missed it, but I think it was fine. So now we've got an episode back. We've got the season three premiere. Um, now that we're back in full effect, how did you feel about the episode, Bob? Promising? Disappointing? You know, it's promising, but the this there is a bit of the twenty four effect or the the Dexter effect, maybe. Can I call it that? I don't you know. know. Twenty four probably is right, since some of the creators of twenty four do Homeland. Oh, I didn't even realize that. Yeah. Um, you know, there's this. A story arc that has to sort of adhere to um, the camera being on certain characters, which is fine. Again, I don't mean to get too annoyed by that, but what made season one so great was that it was in isolation, it was great. And then season two had to play by some rules that made it less good, and I feel like season three has even more rules and, and uh, stipulations attached to it to make it interesting, but I, I could be wrong. I, I'm I'm excited. It's an enjoyable show, and I want the I want I'm I want the best out of it. But I don't feel like they can. I feel like they have one arm tied behind their back, so to speak. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I thought it was mostly promising too. You know, I I read somewhere online. I wish I could remember and can credit them, but someone pointed out that you could almost just forget season two ever happened. Just if you say that the big bombing that everyone's trying to figure out what happened was Brody uh, blowing up the bunker. Uh, then they would still have these committee hearings. They would still have Carrie feeling really oh. bad because she didn't see the uh, didn't see it coming. Brody would still be out of everyone's life. Um, it wouldn't take much, you know, rejiggering to to have just appended season three on the season one. Um, that's it. That's that's blowing my mind because that that makes me feel like season three has more control over its fate than I'm giving it credit for. So we'll yeah, see. Maybe, uh, maybe, and maybe when we watch it in the future, we can just forget about season two. Although season two wasn't that bad, it was just no, it, it had some good episodes, definitely. Yeah. Anyway, I just have a fantasy that Brody actually killed himself in uh, season one. <laughs> that would have made season one a much better episode, and the whole yeah. series a better series. Probably. Uh, anything else you want to say, Bob? Looking forward to it. It's a new show. I'm excited. Uh, it's back to quality TV. I feel like we've been recapping a lot of subpar stuff, uh, and this feels like it's on a uh, on that higher plane. I'm hopeful, anyway. That's what I'm hoping for. 
yeah, I thought it was solid. I like getting Saul's story in the foreground. Carrie's on the verge of blowing up again. And that verge, before she's actually blown up, is uh, is where she's best, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, we're getting a glimpse of that. Uh, we're also seeing what a brody show might look like, in case it ever comes to that. Sure. So far, so good. I'm excited to see more. Cool. 